Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm an, inves an investigative reporter. And uh, investigative reporters are peculiar persons. And it's not just me. Uh, it's a network of uh, investigators all across Eastern Europe. Uh, and what we do is we investigate organized crime and corruption. And the aim of my talk right now is to make you into investigative reporters at the end of these 15 minutes. But I'll start, you know, by saying that uh, we see reality in a bit of a different way. I heard the speeches this morning, and uh, there's a lot of talk about propaganda. There's a lot of talk about uh, people that are able to manipulate people in power. And uh, I'm seeing something else. I'm seeing uh, people that are interested in money. I'm seeing the money layer behind the propaganda, behind the people in power. And I think that's, that's where the danger comes from. That's where all this uh, manipulation uh, comes from. In, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not talking only about Eastern Europe. My group is, uh, is operating in Eastern Europe all the way from Russia to Albania, in Central Europe, everywhere. And we investigate organized crime and corruption. But I'm seeing the same in Latin America. I'm seeing the same in Africa. I'm seeing the same everywhere. And, uh, you know, some people say that the answer to this is open data. Uh, some people say it's transparency. Uh, some people say, you know, that uh, we need to account, you know, uh, you know for, for the powerful. We need to, to show uh, how they really are. Some people say that, you know, the political systems are completely broken and that we have to reinvent ourselves. Um, and what I say uh, as an investigative reporter is that we need to understand the reality uh, um, around us a little bit better. And um, there was a lot of talk, you know, a few years ago about citizen journalism. It was basically that everybody can be a journalist. And um, I was very reluctant back then when I heard this, uh, this thing, you know, because not everybody can be a journalist. But everybody can be an investigator. Everybody can be a researcher. And I'll start by showing you uh, a short uh, animation film. It's a, a two-minute film, uh, which would talk about the country where actually the open data movement is quite vivid, is quite strong. And you see what happens in that country. Uh, so can we play the, the film, please? It started a decade ago, when a mysterious criminal group figured out a foolproof scheme to steal millions of dollars. The way it worked was simple and easily repeated. Secretive offshore paper companies would claim fake debts from state or private firms in Ukraine, Moldova, or Russia, who sometimes were in on the deal. Bribe judges in the Republic of Moldova or Ukraine would accept the claims and rule in favor of the criminals. The company would pay off the debt to the offshore, and the money, protected by a court ruling, was effectively laundered and headed for Europe. Law enforcement was not sophisticated enough to figure out what was happening, or too corrupt to care. Then, in 2008, while Moldovan police were raiding a company involved in a relatively small $4 million fraud case, they found boxes full of rubber stamps, the kind used by companies to certify their official records. The mysterious stamps came from dozens of British and Delaware-based companies. The police seized them, but days later, they were ordered to return them along with six computers they had confiscated. What they didn't know at the time was that they just missed an opportunity to stop what would become one of the largest money laundering operations in the world. The scheme, unabated, continued to grow more sophisticated. Eventually, with the help of British formation agents, the criminals inserted their offshore companies into the ownership structures of a number of Moldovan banks. And those fake offshore companies, whose stamps police had once had in their hands, by the spring of 2014, they had laundered $20 billion, and that's just what we know about. To keep police confused, they blatantly forged documents, changing the spelling of names each time. Finally, in the end of 2014, they pulled another big one. This mysterious criminal team made massive loans, $1 billion worth, from the banks that they controlled to fake companies. The money promptly disappeared. Even now, the great Moldovan laundering machine keeps spinning and nobody seems to know how to stop it. And the perpetrators? Some have fled, many more remain unknown. But the laundromat spins on. So, what you see here is a country that is looted. Uh, you know, the GDP of, uh, of a country like the Republic of Moldova is a bit more than 8 billion uh, US dollars a year. 
Now we're talking about frauds in 20 billion you know, uh, US dollars in, I mean, there's, there's lots, lots of billions that are taken out of the uh, banking system of the country. Some money entered the country, some money leave the country. And of course, in the meantime, some people get rich. And usually these are the politicians. These are the people that make the laws. Now, imagine, um, the Republic of Moldova was for a long time a darling of the EU, you know. Uh, Ukraine is, you know, the, the, the conflict is, uh, was raging there for a long period of time. It's still lingering, you know. And Moldova was uh, seen a little bit uh, like a more stable, uh, uh, stable country and uh, was seen like a success story. Now, if you go right now to Chisinau, you'll see that um, a lot of the population is disillusioned with the European Union. They don't trust the EU anymore because what they see is the political class that enrich themselves. And it doesn't matter if they're liberals or socialists or communists or whatever. If you look at the business layer, they're all together in this. Uh, so, of course, the population is not happy about this. You know, they took the streets uh, last year many times uh, uh, chanting, we want our billion back. They were talking about the billion that was taken out of the, of the banks uh, in Moldova. That was how little they knew about the fraud that is taking place in their own tiny country. They didn't know about the 20 billion, they didn't know about other 60 billion that were stolen, a lot, a lot of money for this country. Now, when you look at how uh, criminals operate, you see that they all, always create networks. Um, they create networks that operate across many, many frontiers. Uh, some of the companies used in these frauds you know, were based in Delaware in the US. Some were based uh, in Dubai and in many, many other jurisdictions. Um, and one thing that, that people don't, don't see sometimes is that criminals are very, very clever people. Some of these criminals, some of these mobsters could have been the next, I don't know, Bill Gates, very successful businessman. They are extremely, extremely clever. Um, most, most time, you know, when people think about criminals, they think about a thug at the corner of the street. These are different criminals that pull, to, uh, pull together such schemes, you know, such money laundering schemes. And of course, this money is from drug trafficking, from smuggling humans, uh, from, you know, all sorts of, uh, of crimes. Um, now, j just, just to give you an example of how these criminals operate, um, when we exposed this scheme, the law in Moldova said that uh, if you own a bank, if you own more than 5% uh, in a bank, you have to declare the ownership who is the real owner, who is the beneficiary owner of the, of the bank. After we reported on this, there were you know, lots of uh, problems that were created for these criminals. Uh, they, they lost some of the banks and, and all that. And the government decided to change the law in the sense uh, to increase the transparency. So they, they lowered the threshold. So now they say it's got to be 1%. So if you own more than 1%, you have to disclose ownership because they felt you know, that if you lower the threshold like this, then criminals will not be able to operate. Now, guess what? If you look at some of the Moldovan banks right now, you'll see lots of offshore companies that own 0.9% of the bank. So criminals always adapt. Um, and this is something that can be, can be fought, but only if we operate just as the criminals do. And that means, you know, if we exchange information across borders without any problem, if we're able to not just look at, uh, you know, databases, uh, formats, you know, and uh, if they're friendly or, or not, you know, uh, if, we're, if we're able to look a little bit beyond open data, if we're able to, to actually integrate open data in our investigative processes better. Um, and I'll run you through... Okay, so this is, this is the scheme that, you know, the film was, uh, was talking about. Uh, and I, I won't go into this, but uh, again, you see this uh, involves money going into, uh, into a, a European Union uh, uh, country uh, in Latvia, which is uh, not that far from here. It's, it's a Baltic country. Now, the money, this 20 billion, they all went into one bank called Trasta, Commerzbanka. Um, usually banks need to do their due diligence. They need to, uh, to inquire about, you know, uh, I mean, if you, if you want to open a, 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 a bank account in a bank, you'll, ha you'll have to, fi to file you know, a lot of paperwork, to present lo lots of documents, to present where your income comes from and all that. Now imagine 20 billion US dollars, which is a staggering amount of money, entering a bank without questions asked. That's what happened you know, in, in this case with the money from Moldova going into Latvia. Now this bank recently lost its banking license as a result of this uh, criminal scheme that they were part of. But 
it's, it's not always like that. There are lots of other banks that are willing to perform such services you know, at ease and uh, without questions asked. Um, this is, you know, I mean, if you, if you really look at how, um, how this scheme was, uh, was conducted, uh, it's laughable. Uh, what you see here, you know, it's the so-called promissory notes. These are pieces of paper that were presented to a judge in Moldova in order to certify, in, in order to enable these money transfers that uh, were in the tune of 20 billion uh, in the end. So this piece of paper, for instance, is worth 580 million US dollars. And based on this, you know, um, the, the money were, were wired. Now, if you look at it, it's really, you know, it's, it's comical because the, uh, the person uh, who's actually signing this, it's a Mrs. Jesse Grant Hester, but there's no Mrs. Jesse Grant Hester anywhere in the world, you know. It's actually a Mr. Jesse Grant Hester, you know, who lives right now somewhere in Mauritius, who actually uh, put his uh, uh, signature on, on this document. So, what I'm saying is that if you're really focused on, on the crime, you can see such, you know, tiny bits of information that can indicate that you know the crime is about to be committed. This is why what we do at my organization, at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, is we are trying to be pre-crime. <laughs> and this is very controversial, right? I mean, you all uh, saw Minority Report, I think, the, the film with Tom Cruise, when people, you know, that, you know and the, the crime of thought and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what I'm talking about is very, very different. What I'm seeing uh, when I'm investigating uh, uh, criminals is that they they look at, uh, at the crime as a commodity. So, for instance, if a criminal group operates in Moldova and pulls, uh, pulls together this, uh, pulls this criminal scheme for 20 billion, uh, if they're caught, you know, if some members of the group are caught, they just change the country. So they just cross the border with the criminal scheme, together with the criminal scheme. We expose many criminals in Eastern Europe that move to West Africa, and so on. So when I'm talking about pre-crime, I'm talking about um, being able to identify criminal patterns in data. So, if I look at this document here, I see that there's a Delaware company that has to pay money to a company in London uh, at this address on Tully Street. Now, what I would do right now is I would look for all the instances of such deals in big batches of data. Those might mean, you know, the data in companies' house, in the UK, UK registry of uh, companies, in the Delaware registry of companies, and so on and so on. So, because the idea is to identify the patterns and then you can follow the crime. So it's a, it's a bit more than just following the money, because sometimes uh, you follow you know, the criminal scheme in its entirety. And you see that there are very little uh, differences in the way that criminals uh, do their crime, because there are so many ways to steal money. In the end, it's still about stealing the money. Uh, Transparency. So, if you look, if you investigated that, uh, that scheme from the point of view of uh, documents provided um, by registers of companies in Moldova, in Ukraine, uh, what you'd find out is that um, one of the main guys behind this crime is this guy. You see, he's enjoying a Baltica beer here. Now, does this guy look like a 20 billion uh, US dollars guy? He's a homeless guy. He's, he's basically, he, he has nothing. I mean, he has, he has debts to the bank. He has, he has nothing. But of course, if you look at the paper level, you'll see that he's behind this. He's used as a proxy or a front or, a, or, or an agent or whatever. He, he has no idea that he's actually behind this, uh, this scheme. He's, uh, we actually met him, and he was very, very keen in showing us his... Uh, you know, <laughs> skills. But if you look deeper, if you look deeper at this, uh, what you'll find out is that uh, the implications are very, very deep. And uh, the countries involved, you know, are Russia, are Moldova, are Ukraine, and you'll see these huge money flows between these countries. And if Moldova would become a part of the EU, this would be much harder uh, to do, to move such amounts of money. Uh, if Ukraine would become part of the EU, that would be much, much harder. If the UK would change their laws in the sense of more transparency, and I'm talking about real transparency, not just on paper, you know, such schemes would not be possible. Because if you look at this, you know, what you find out is that uh, one, of the, one of the main characters involved in this fraud is a guy called Igor Putin, who's no other than the cousin of Vladimir Putin. 
Because again, this level of money, this level of corruption cannot be done without high-level political involvement. Now, when we investigated this scheme, what we found out was uh, that some of the banks involved were the sa same banks that financed, uh, for, uh, for instance, the National Front in France, the uh, Marine Le Pen uh, movement there, uh, and other, other movements uh, in Europe. So, um, such schemes are, you know, used to, uh, you know, for personal uh, enrichment. You know, some of these people build hotels and they try to sell them on to some other, uh, some hotel chains like Mr. Alexander Grigoriev. Uh, and some, you know, uh, bought really uh, nice luxury mansions in Monaco and so on and so on, and yachts and, you know, the, the, the usual criminal stuff, you know. Um, and this is where you come in. I mean, this is the Magnitsky case that we also uh, exposed, you know. It's, um, it's, it's a famous case, I, I won't go into it, but it's about a Russian lawyer who uh, uh, blew the whistle over one of the biggest frauds in Russia, you know, uh, lots of money stolen from the Russian budget. He went to the police, told about the fraud, and uh, the police arrested him and he died in jail, allegedly tortured. So now you see how, how these people operate again. There are many countries involved in this money transfer, so the money were stolen from the Russian budget, and went through all these companies, you know. Um, now, again, if we look at the documents, we'll, we would find, you know, the lots of names of people and all that and all that. But if we do the field work, as investigative reporters do, you see that this house in the center of Kishinev played a central role in the scheme because uh, a few of the companies were based here. And, of course, this is direct uh, observation where you can see that there's nothing there and this, this is all bogus. Um, now, The Magnitsky case, the laundromat, that's the 20 billion uh, case. If you look at the banking records, as we did, you'll see there are at least 40 countries involved. That means registers of companies in 40 countries. That means courts in 40 countries and so on. That means criminals had connections in all these countries. And this can only be investigated if we as investigators have connections in these countries. This is why, and this is where you come in. You're from all over the world. You should do your bit of investigative reporting in order to be able to deter these criminals uh, from doing business as usual. Because it takes a network to fight a network. And I'll stop here. Yes. Thank you.